Okay, well, um, I'd like to read for you our text. We're going to be looking specifically at Romans 15, verses 20 through 24. But Paul, in verse 24, begins the transition into what we're going to be looking at <clears throat> next week. And as he does, it kind of leaves the sentence hanging. So what, what I thought I would do is read through verse 25, uh, which is just a few words. Okay. So Romans 15, beginning in verse 20, he says, And thus, thinking about having preached from Jerusalem to Illyricum, and thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, and here's where the quote comes from Isaiah 52, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. For this reason, I have often been prevented from coming to you, coming to the Romans, but now with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while, but now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. Sometimes Paul just sort of breaks off what he, his thought and, and moves on to another subject, and we're not going to hold that against him. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it is what he wrote, what, what he desired to write, but it's also what the Lord intended for him to write for our edification and our understanding. Okay, so what we want to look at this evening is reaching those who haven't heard. Now, this morning, we, again, saw something of Paul's heart, what it is that he gloried in, remember, what he boasted in, what he took pride in, and it wasn't anything that had to do with him personally, not his Jewish heritage, not his elite theological training, nor his having excelled as a religious leader, as a Pharisee. These things, remember, meant less than nothing to him after coming to Christ. Less than nothing because trash, rubbish, dumb. What did matter to him was what Christ had accomplished through him. That through his empowering spirit, he had preached the gospel from Jerusalem to Illyricum. Remember, Illyricum is a word we, maybe the only place in Scripture where it appears, but if you think of Macedonia, if you think of Greece, and you think about, you know, usually we think of the ministry of Paul along that eastern coast. Well, Illyricum would be to, on the west, and it would be to the north. Uh, so at some point, Paul's ministry touched Illyricum. He had gone throughout most of the Roman Empire, he said, bringing many Gentiles to the obedience of the faith. Now, this evening, he tells us something of his strategy and perhaps why it is that he was able to cover so much ground. It's because it was his desire to bring the gospel to those areas it had not yet reached. And since he's telling us here in our passage, the eastern Mediterranean was now evangelized, he began looking towards the west. So Paul wanted to bring the gospel to those who had not heard. He says in verse 20, And thus I aspired to preach the gospel not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. Now I've already told you he's referring back here to what he said in verse 19. As, you know, the, uh, the, the distance he had already gone, the ground he had already covered from Jerusalem to Illyricum. His aspiration, his desire, his ambition, his aim, he says, was not to build on another man's foundation. He didn't want to continue the work begun by someone else, but what he wanted to do was bring the gospel to new areas. He wanted to break new ground. And I think understanding that helps us to understand what he was talking about when he addressed one of the disagreements among the Corinthians. Remember, 1 Corinthians was written to address many disagreements, and one of them happened to be a split between two persons, one of them being Paul and the other one being Apollos. Now, let me read this to you and, and think about this in light of what we're talking about this evening. For when one says, I am of Paul, 
And another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? Who then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Now notice, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now, first thing we need to realize here is that this was not a debate over what Paul said versus what Apollos said, because we, we have to believe the two were in agreement. If they weren't, Paul would certainly have set Apollos straight. But rather, whether the Corinthians should appreciate Paul and follow him who planted the church or Apollos who came after him to water and nurture it. Paul's solution to the problem was this. Don't look at us. We're just men. We're nothing. God is everything. The one who creates new life, who causes it to grow, you need to think about him. You need to follow him. You need to worship him. Uh, one interesting thing to note here is when, uh, well, I should say, when Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, he was at Corinth. So this was a fresh issue uh, for him. Now, the point, though, from this text and, and from the text we're looking at this evening is that Paul was a groundbreaker. Paul was somebody who planted churches. That's what we see him doing throughout the book of Acts. Now, he didn't just, you know, uh, again, win people to Christ and then, and then run to the next country. He did make sure that they were established before he moved on, and he even returned later to um, ordain um, you know, leaders in the church for the ongoing ministry of the word there. But he saw his ministry as, again, breaking up the ground, breaking into new territories. He did not believe that he was called to nurture existing works that were planted by somebody else, but to establish new ones to fulfill what the Lord said through Isaiah in the passage that we looked at in our meditation and we've already read in our text, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. Again, you see the idea, breaking new ground. Now, he goes on to say that this was why he had not yet visited Rome. Verse 22, for this reason, I have often been prevented from coming to you. The reason being is that there was a church already established in Rome. Remember, established by the Jewish converts on the day of Pentecost who later returned home after being discipled in order to plant a church there. Since there was a church there and there were still areas where there was no church, Paul was prevented from coming to the Romans because he needed to go to these other places first. Now, we need to recognize that Paul was not unconcerned about the fact that this church was planted by someone else. He did, after all, write his letter, this letter we're reading now, to the Romans to ground them in the faith. It's just that up until this time, there were other places that had no gospel witness. But now that that work was done, okay, that was completed, he was hoping to visit them on his way into new territory. And that's what we read about in verses 23 through 25. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and be helped on my way there by you, when I have first enjoyed your company for a while, but now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. That part we're going to look at next time. But by no further place in these regions. He doesn't mean by this that by, you know, by now he's become so well known and so well hated that there was no longer any work, no longer any opportunities because nobody would put up with him. That's, that's not what he was talking about. What he's saying is that the, the need no longer existed. He had fulfilled the mandate to preach in eastern Mediterranean area. There were churches that planted in every major metropolitan center. I mean, think about, again, how much the Lord was able to accomplish through this one man. 
Now, the time had come then to begin a new phase of outreach, to to break into new areas. Now he wanted to move to the western region. And Spain was at the western extremity of the Roman Empire. To get there, Paul would need to sail around Italy. You know, you think about Illyricum. There's, you know, again, uh, some body of water between Illyricum and Italy, but you go from you know, Greece and this Macedonian peninsula, then you come back around Illyricum and it comes down to Italy, and then around Italy over here to Spain, okay? So that's where he wanted to go, and this was going to take him close to Rome where he hoped to receive help from the believers there so that he could accomplish this work. Now, let's, let's focus just for a moment on Spain because... This is the only place in the Bible where we see it mentioned. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but you're reading through the Bible and you come across, you know, you're reading all these, all these names of all these countries, which no longer in use, and then you, you come across Spain. You think, that, oh, that's kind of strange. It just sort of seems to be dropped in there. Here's a, a, a country that still has the same name. But it, it's nowhere else mentioned in the Bible. Okay, just, just two times in Romans chapter 15, making it seem as though it just sort of appears out of the blue. But one thing we need to realize is that there was a port in Spain that was mentioned relatively often in the Bible that we just don't correlate. It's Tarshish, right? Tarshish. One commentator writes this, there can be little doubt that this is the name, Tarshish, of a Phoenician port in Spain Between the two mouths of the Guadalquivir, uh, the name given to the river by the Arabs and meaning the great Wadi or watercourse, the Guadalquivir. It was founded by a Carthaginian colony and was the farthest western harbor of Tyrian sailors. Remember from Tyre, Tyre and Sidon were known for their sailors. And listen, it was to this port Jonah's ship was about to sail from Joppa. He was aboarding a ship heading for Tarshish. Why Tarshish? Because it was as far away as he could possibly get from the other direction where the Lord told him to go. It has well been styled the Peru of Tyrian adventure. It abounded in gold and silver mines. Now the Lord had also said through the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 66 verses 18 through 19, The time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them and will send survivors from them to the nations, Tarshish, which is Spain, Put and Lud, which are, are, well, are actually sections of North Africa, Meshach, Rosh, and Tubal, which is south of the Black Sea in modern Turkey, And Javan, Asia Minor, or Greece. By the way, if if you can follow what I was just talking about there, what what we're really looking at is a prophecy about the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. So he was going to, to send survivors to these nations, to the distant coastlands that have neither heard my fame nor seen my glory, and they will declare my glory among the nations." Now, one commentator sees this passage in Isaiah referring to the same thing that Jesus was referring to in the Olivet Discourse, which is, of course, our favorite stomping ground, isn't it? Speaking of what would take place after he would send his disciples out during the course of their ministry, which Luke records for us in Acts. So this is from Matthew 24, verses 9 through 14. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. By the way, just think about what happens in the book of Acts, okay? And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now listen, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, remember that 
For that interpretation to work on this passage, we need to see the end as the end of the Jewish dispensation and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which means that what Jesus was referring to prior to this was what his disciples were going to go through as they were fulfilling the Great Commission. Um, they would suffer persecution. All these things would be happening, and we see Paul was not an easy road for him, but notice the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world, even as Isaiah said it would as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Whole world there, not being the entire globe, but the whole world in those days being another term for the Roman Empire. Now, Luke doesn't tell us whether Paul ever made this trip all the way to Spain. Acts closes before, you know, that, that actually took place, if it did, in fact, took place. His account ends with Paul's first Roman imprisonment, which was from 60 to 62, about A.D. But he was released for a time from 62 to 66 A.D., and subsequently imprisoned again before he was executed under Nero in 67, okay, so prior to 70 AD. It's possible that he visited Spain between 62 and 66, and if what Jesus says is true, and, and should I say if, I can, can I put an if there? If this is referring to 70 AD, it means that Paul or somebody actually did reach Spain because it was part of the whole world. It was part of the Roman Empire. Well, there are those who believe that Paul did reach Spain during that time frame, during what is known as his fourth missionary journey. We usually think of the three, but there was a fourth. One commentator writes this, the fourth century church historian Eusebius preserves a tradition that Paul was released from that imprisonment. You know, there is some debate about whether there's a first and second imprisonment, and there's, there certainly seems to be. I think perhaps was established by this time. Okay, so Paul was released from that imprisonment, continued his missionary labors, and was martyred by Nero on his second visit to Rome. If there were two imprisonments, Paul was released from his first around AD 62. According to later tradition, he was martyred by Nero, who died in AD 68. Now Clement, in his first epistle to the Corinthians, writes this, talking about Paul. After that, he had been seven times in bonds, had been driven into exile, had been stoned, had preached in the east and in the west. He won the noble renown, which was the reward of his faith, having taught righteousness unto the whole world and having reached the farthest bounds of the west. Okay, so Clement believes that Paul reached the furthest bounds of the west and one commentator by the name of Otto F.A. Mendaris, a German pastor and professor of Coptic studies, Coptic being Egyptian, writes this, for a Roman, the farthest bounds of the West, a phrase often used by Roman writers to refer to Spain, could only mean the Iberian Peninsula, which is talking about Spain and Portugal. Okay? So the point is, Paul wanted to keep pushing the boundaries of Christ's kingdom to reach those who had not been reached, who had no gospel witness. And it appears as though Paul not only evangelized the Eastern Mediterranean, but he also, on his fourth journey, reached as far as the West so that when 70 AD came, the entire world had been reached. Now, we need to pause uh, here from the history lesson and the understanding of this text and just think about how we might apply this today. Uh, obviously, we need to continue the effort, don't we? This is the commission that Jesus gave to his church, that he gave to us. We're all partly responsible for it. He says in Acts 1 verse 8, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. <clears throat> and perhaps here our Lord has in mind more than just the Roman Empire, because that wasn't going to be the end of all things. After the destruction of Jerusalem, there was going to be, um, and I, I believe this is in the, all of the discourse as well, when the Lord says that he's going to send forth his angels and gather his elect from 
north, south, and east, and west. He's not talking about the rapture, but he's talking about sending his messengers out to the furthest reaches of the earth in order to bring the gospel to them, which is ongoing right now. Now, the question is, how far have we progressed since the days of the Apostle Paul? Where do we stand right now? Well, the Joshua Project, perhaps you've heard of that, um, is a Christian organization that, quote, seeks to coordinate the work of missionary organizations to track the ethnic groups of the world with the fewest followers of evangelical Christianity, close quote, who interestingly as an organization, to my surprise, as I'm just surfing the web trying to find statistics, they hold to the Westminster Confession of Faith, among other confessions, and they're endorsed by Desiring God Ministries. Well, here are the statistics they give. They estimate that of the, and this is, this is a phenomenal number, 17,443 distinct people groups in the world. Can you believe there's that many? 17,443 distinct people groups. And I'm assuming they mean, they mean by that differing languages, perhaps? I don't know, maybe cultures? But out of those, 7,423 of them who represent 3.37 billion people out of the total world population of 7.93 billion people, or about 42.5 percent, that's what these 7,423 unreached distinct people groups represent, 42.5 percent of the world's population, they are still completely unreached. They have no gospel witness. And we should assume that among the 57.5% that have been, which again are represented by this, what the, uh, well, the balance between the uh, seven, I, I don't know if I can do it quick enough, I think it'd be about 4.6 billion people. I think we'd have to assume the majority of them have not heard. I mean, the fact that, that you have a gospel witness among a distinct people group doesn't mean everybody in that people group has heard the gospel. That'd be like saying everybody in the United States has heard the gospel. Um, it's more likely to happen, but I, I highly doubt that that is the case. So the question is, what can we do in light of what it is we've been looking at this evening? Well, first of all, we should certainly be praying. We can pray and we ought to pray because this is how the Lord advances His work. Pray for the efforts that are being made to reach the unreached. I mean, the, the Joshua Project exists because they want to make sure that there is a gospel witness everywhere in the world. So we can pray for them and we can, we can, as the Lord leads and provides, we can give to further that work. Secondly, we can also support the watering and the nurturing of the churches already planted. I mean, one thing we need to recognize is that Paul did not say that what Apollos did was unimportant. He was just simply saying that that wasn't his ministry. His ministry was to break new ground. But nurturing existing churches is also important, so we can support them, those efforts, through prayer, um, and pray that those works that have already been established are encouraged by the Lord to spread the gospel. And by the way, that brings us to our third point. We are one of those churches that have been planted. I mean, not just this local congregation, but the church has been planted in the United States which means that we also can reach out to those around us who have not heard the gospel. You know, the New Testament tells us that when churches were planted, they were planted strategically in major cities of the Roman Empire, and the reason why was because of the people traveling through and because of the believers who were there would spread the gospel at every opportunity they had. Uh, Paul often mentioned that uh, from certain places where churches were planted, the gospel had, had been sounding out to the entire world. So there was a strategy that was involved in what Paul was doing. He didn't go to the obscure town and village, but he went to the major metropolitan areas so that the gospel would get out uh, even more quickly. Now, today, we have plenty of churches. You know, you think about, are there churches in major metropolitan areas? Yes. Are there churches in smaller communities? Yes, we have many churches. 
But the question is, is the level of evangelism that is ongoing right now the same as it was in those days? Now, things have changed, and we realize the dynamics are, are different. But the obligation is still the same. We still need to try to find a way to reach them. And we should not assume that the people who live in this country, the people who are around us, the people we run into, we should not assume, unless we know them and know their background, that they've ever heard the gospel. Or if they have heard it, that they've heard it accurately, that they, they've heard a clear presentation. There's so many gospels out there and so many you know, poor representations, poor presentations of the gospel. So we should try to reach those people that we can, that God gives us opportunity to reach, buy up those opportunities to um, explain the gospel to them to bring the gospel to them. And fourthly, of course, we can nurture believers, water believers, so to speak, as the Lord gives us opportunities. J. Gresham Machen, the man who's credited with basically being the founder of this denomination, believed that Reformed churches had two tasks. The first was to evangelize the lost. I'd say by far that's the most important. But second, to help our less informed brethren to come to a fuller understanding of the gospel. And again, that's something we can do as the Lord gives us opportunity. We can share the truth that the Lord has entrusted to us with others to help them in their Christian walk. Now, one last principle. We need to practice what it is that Jesus told his disciples to do. And, and this, this can be kind of hard. He said in Matthew 10, 14, and again, remembering the situation is a little bit different than our particular situation. He said, whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. He also said in Sermon on the Mount, don't cast your pearl before swine. There does come a time when it's, it's time to move on, Right? I think we do need to be careful not to make our life's work trying to convert one or two people, right? To try to convince somebody who's heard the gospel over and over again but refuses to believe. You know, there does come a point where you don't really need to do that anymore, but rather commit the matter to prayer and come before the Lord and asking for His mercy and His grace upon them and then move on to others who have not heard the gospel, okay? We, we, there are people who haven't been reached. We need to try to reach them as well. And so as the Lord has given to us hearts that truly desire to honor Him and His cause, let's be encouraged by Paul's example. Let's be instructed by this example. Let's be encouraged by His, his zeal and His obedience to the Great Commission to reach the lost sheep with the gospel, but let's also just think about His strategy that it's not just people who have heard, but people who haven't heard. And it's not just, again, people that need to be evangelized, but, but brothers and sisters in Christ that need to be built up. And I should say, Apollos' example as well. We can learn from both of those. And I believe the Lord wants us to, and to apply those, and to put, again, these things into practice. So may the Lord give us the grace to do that. Let, let's bow for just a moment of prayer. And let's uh, ask for the Lord's help.